our next speaker is Dr. Randy Hunt. Uh, Dr. Hunt is one of our pulmonary critical care physicians at, based at EUH who mostly deals with cystic fibrosis and lung transplantation, but we're talking today about fever in the ICU. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Micah. So, can everyone hear me okay? Great. As a resident, uh, many years ago now, I uh, often received pages in the middle of the night informing me that some of my patients were having fevers. And this was very common and a fairly easy page to take care of. Many times I was just being informed of it if the patient had already been started on antibiotics or had some sort of infectious workup. What the page was really requesting was some kind of antipyretic therapy. And this was an order I was very willing and happy and glad to, to provide. Later in my career, I had the opportunity to round in the ICU with a, an attending who felt very strongly that we shouldn't be reflexively treating uh, fevers. Um, now, needless to say, this was not met with universal acceptance, and I cannot express to you the amount of discomfort that this created within the ICU setting of not treating fevers reflexively. Not only discomfort amongst our patients' family members who felt we were neglecting their loved ones by not treating their fevers, but also other care providers who felt we weren't adequately caring for our patients by uh, not uh, treating or preventing their fevers. And so that experience really got me to start thinking about our own regards towards fever control, our own sort of uh, how we, um, uh, our own, what we bring to the table, as well as um, any particular side effects or detriments to antipyretic therapy versus potential benefits. And that's what I hope to share with you more today. So over the next few minutes, we'll discuss the mechanisms of temperature regulation. As you can imagine, in most things in the human physiology, it's fairly complex. We'll also identify common causes of fever within the ICU. But what I really want to spend most of the time on is discussing potential benefits or risk of antipyretic therapy. Now, a caveat to this is I'm going to focus most of my time on sepsis or infections relating to fever or non-neurologic, non-infectious uh, etiologies of fever. Fever associated with neurologic insults is really uh, deserves its own um, category and its own talk. And, and I'm a medical intensivist by training, so I'm going to, we'll, if we have questions about that, we can talk about it. Um, but it's not going to be the focus of this talk. So fever is really a cornerstone vital sign, right? It, it often prompts infectious workups. It's certainly very important in protocols for neutropenic fever and neonatal sepsis. And it's responsible for numerous ER presentations, office visits, and after-hour calls. So a little bit of definitions. Our temperature actually varies pretty uh, widely throughout the day. Our average mean temperature is around 36.8, which is around 98.2 degrees Fahrenheit, but it can fluctuate up to a whole degree Celsius throughout the day. Fever is somewhat arbitrarily defined. However, the, at least as far as the temperature at which fever occurs, what fever really is is a shift of the hypothalamic set point. So the thermostat within the brain changes and it raises our core temperature. Many societies have discussed where fever really begins. So the American College of Critical Care of Medicine and the Infectious Disease Society of America have come together and defined uh, somewhat arbitrarily, again, as I mentioned, a temperature of 38.3 degrees as being a fever. And many other societies agree with this, although, again, this is somewhat of an arbitrary measure. Hypothermia is, again, excessive heat production or absorption. Again, your core temperature is raised. However, the thermostat within the brain, the hypothalamic step point, has not been changed. And then I'll mention hyperpyrexia briefly. It's excessively high fever, over 106 degrees Fahrenheit. We mostly see this with central nervous system insults. So a little bit about mechanisms. There are actually several different pathways in which fever can occur, both uh, chemical as well as neurologically. Um, I'm going to talk about a classic one. So an exposure to a microbial insult um, can, when, it, uh, when leukocytes are exposed to microbial insults, there's a number of what we consider exogenous pyrogens that get released. These are pathogen-associated uh, molecular proteins that then turn on uh, or cause the release of a number of chemicals, cytokines within leukocytes, namely tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-beta-1, and IL-6, which are considered to be endogenous pyrogens. These, in turn, can stimulate endothelial cells to release COX-2 and prostaglandin E2, which will, um, it, within the preoptic hypothalamic area, cause that rise in the set uh, 
temperature set point of the body. This leads to a number of physiologic and behavioral instincts that occur that raises our core temperature, such as peripheral vasoconstriction and shivering. So fever, as you all probably are aware of, super common in the ICU. Upwards of 70% of all admissions are complicated. And there's a number of epidemiologic studies that suggest fever has been associated with increased length of care and as, as such, increased cost of care and also potentially poorer outcomes. There's a lot of causes of fever as well, and this can be the bane of many intensivists and other care providers. We always we're always concerned about the infectious cause, particularly in the medical ICU, because there's so many different environments in which infection can occur, uh, bacteremia, urinary tract infections, colitis, and sinusitis. But you can also divide, fe there, remember, fever is a nonspecific response to both infectious and non-infectious stimuli. So you can also divide fever causes up into a non-infectious with and without shock. And you can see a few here. Drug fever is, uh, was previously uh, discussed a little bit about this morning, and it can certainly be the bane of many intensivists and ID doctors, particularly in the ICU. Pancreatitis, venous thromboembolism, ischemia, they can present with or without shock, but many times will, will uh, be associated with fevers as well. Our perceptions of fever are, are pretty strong in how we feel about fever. So this, is, uh, this was a study looking at care providers within a pediatric uh, large center and just basically wanted to determine what their ideas about fever control uh, were. So it explored about 400 uh, patients' parents and asked them, uh, and most of these patient parents had, had, were well educated and asked how they felt about fever control. Well, 50% of them believed that any fever, if left unchecked, would, could lead to febrile seizures. And upwards of 25%, a, a fair minority, believed that a fever, any fever, if left unchecked or uncontrol uncontrolled, could lead to detrimental, severe, irreversible brain damage. So these are care providers, but as, uh, as primary care and, and specialists, we know better, correct? Well, maybe not. So this was another cross-sectional study looking at both care providers and primary care providers. So physicians that included pediatricians, intensivists, um, internal medicine docs, as well as family medicine docs. And 85% of these respondents said that they would awaken a sleeping child to treat fever if that child had a fever even if the child appeared comfortable. So, and why is that? Well, fever makes us feel horrible. We've all had fever, and we know how it makes us feel. You feel icky, um, you're hot, and then cold, and um, who doesn't want this little girl to feel better, right? So the other thing is fever is treatable, and as a simple act of caring, we often treat it. The converse, though, is fever has been around for millennia. It is evolutionarily preserved and is found throughout the animal kingdom. Mammals, fish, reptiles, amphibians all show signs of physiologic fever. If you take lizards, cold-blooded animals, and inflict them with an infection, and then prevent them from seeking out warmer microclimates, where they can then raise their core temperature, they will die more frequently due to their infection even cold-blooded animals. And it makes you wonder if something that has been so evolutionary preserved within the human species, um, is it as detrimental as we think it is? And it turns out it probably has some benefits. So there's a lot of in vitro studies looking at increased temperature regulation on mostly infections. So we know that increased temperatures are that what we consider for fevers in, in humans increase antibiotic sensitivity, macrophages, uh, are able to phagocytose pathogens easier in higher temperatures. Uh, other leukocytes and, and macrophages are able to uh, be more mobile and, and reach the pathogen easier. And there's plenty of studies that suggest that there's re reduced growth of bacteria in the settings of higher temperature. So it makes you think that there's potentially beneficial effects of fever. And there's been a number of other studies that have showed other things again. But the important thing to remember is that humans are far more complex than a petri dish. And so there are other aspects that may occur that make fever detrimental. Uh, as intensivists, we deal with human physiology at the extremes, and any perturbations of that physiology may be catastrophic. So we all know that with fever, there's increase in metabolic demand. And if you're at the extremes of human physiology in the ICU, uh, even a little bit of increase in metabolic demand may have disastrous con consequences in terms of neurologic or cardiovascular consequences. Plus, there's patient discomfort. We already know 
that's oftentimes associated with fever, and then there's potentially collateral tissue damage. So it turns out that this sort of argument for whether or not fever control is appropriate has been going on for centuries. And so giants in medicine have um, uh, been on both sides of this coin, whether or not fever is a beneficial thing or it's detrimental to the human experience. I don't know that we'll answer the question today, but I hope to, hope to muddy it up for you a little bit. So fever is super common in the ICU, as we already talked about. This is an observational study looking at over 24,000 ICU admissions, and there's a couple of take-home points, I think. One, super common again, so upwards of anywhere from 30 to almost 50% of ICU admission days were associated with fever. Now, I didn't put this on here, but what this did show is fever in and of itself had no difference in mortality. But if you look at individuals who had very high fevers, so this is about a fever over 103 degrees Fahrenheit, there was an increase in mortality. And this was primarily driven by individuals who didn't have fever on admission and developed it later in their ICU course. So maybe it's associated with increase in mortality, maybe it's not. So we turned to some animal models to, to uh, explore this further. So this was a mouse model of a gram-negative bacteremia. Uh, specifically what they gave is some Klebsiella down the throat of the, these mice, and then they just saw how quickly they died. What was interesting is they found that mice that developed a fever, they had a more robust neutrophilic response and more cytokines within the BAL. But as you can see in their Kaplan-Meier curve here, they actually died more frequently. So these were mice that had fever. And they hypothesized, now again, again, this is an animal study, but they hypothesized that potentially the excessive bacterial killing that was associated with fever um, caused collateral tissue damage. But mice are not men. So as you get more complex in the mammalian structure, this is looking, this took sheep, again, a fairly small study, but um, a number of sheep and gave them a, infected them with bacteremia, and then they randomized them to either have high fever or allow them to have high fever, or control their fever to more normal thermic. And the fever, the sheep that had fevers actually performed better. The sheep that were uh, treated with ibuprofen and cooling blankets died more readily and more frequently. But there's other things other than just uh, mortality to look at. So we had already discussed that there's a theoretical detriment of having increase in, in metabolic demands within the ICU particularly. So this was a very small study. It's been followed up, but this was one of the first ones. So I want to present that today. But small study that looked at critically ill patients. They didn't differentiate them between sepsis or non-sepsis. Um, but basically used external cooling devices and then did a number of um, physiologic measurements, mostly looking at their oxygen consumption and their CO2 production. And they found that if they could cool the individuals, and they were very successful at cooling these individuals with external mechanical antipyretic means, that there were significant reductions in their oxygen consumption, reductions in their CO2 production, and then decreases to their cardiac output but to normal levels, whereas they were uh, super physiologic before. So that really led to one of the first randomized controlled trials in the ICU looking at septic febrile patients, okay? So this was a fairly large trial at the time, about 500 patients, and they were randomized to receive either ibuprofen administered every six hours for eight doses or placebo. And what they found is, again, they were really good at reducing fever. They could, with that, they could reduce the heart rate. O2 consumption, just as we saw in the previous small study, was actually down, as was lactic acidosis. Despite being a fairly robust study in terms of size, they didn't show any change in duration of shock or vasopressor use, ARDS development, or 30-day mortality. But you say there's a lot of problems with pharmacologic antipyretic therapy, right? We discussed some of them actually just a little while ago. Um, Tylenol has effects on the liver, potentially the kidney as well. NSAIDs, particularly ibuprofen, have GI distress effects as well as can um, affect the kidneys. So this was a nice study that was published in the Blue Journal back in 2012 that looked at external cooling devices as well. And so this was 200 patients that were randomized who had septic shock, were on vasopressors, and were randomized to receive either external cooling or no cooling, as long as their temperature remained under what they considered high temperature, which is 41.5 here. And what I did like about the study is they had a very nice protocol for managing their vasopressors. Their primary outcome was they were looking for a decrease, based on a pilot study, they were looking at a 50% decrease in vasopressor use. 
in individuals who were cooled um, if they had a fever at 48 hours. Not mortality or anything like that. They were very good at, again, reducing fever. So I point, this is their fever curves from individuals who uh, received the external cooling. You can see within two hours they had their fever down to uh, below 38 degrees Celsius. And certainly it was statistically lower than their cohorts. I will point out though that even in the individuals who did not receive cooling but received every other ICU intervention, antibiotics and appropriate uh, timely antibiotics, even that group had resolution of their fever at least as far as the mean values were concerned within just over 24 hours. Obviously there was a large range here, but only 24 hours of fever was associated with the group that even didn't receive cooling. What they found is they were able to decrease the amount of vasopressor requirement for the group that received external cooling. Um, so here's our curves. These are the percentage of patients who had met a 50% vasopressor re reduction. And at 12 hours and 24 hours, not their primary endpoints, they had a reduced uh, uh, need for vasopressor use in the group that had cooling. But by 48 hours, that, uh, that difference had gone away. Now, one thing, if you're familiar with st this study, you may remember that they actually showed a, a mortality difference in the group that received cooling, an improvement in mortality, at 14 days. But the study was not powered for this at all, and that mortality difference went away after their next check, which was 28 days. So I think you have to take that with a grain of salt. So more recently, this, I'm sorry, the same year, there was a larger observational study that looked at fever control in the ICU. So this included almost 1,500 patients, and there was a couple important points that came out of the study, in my opinion. So one, again, fever, very common. So these are individuals who had fever associated with sepsis, and then the right side of the screen is individuals who had fever associated with non-sepsis, some other physiological insult causing fever. And in a lot of individuals, at least a fever of 38.5, there were more than 80% of patients in either group that, or near 80% that had that. This were the, and the other thing to take away is that both groups still received a lot of antipyretic therapy, specifically pharmacologic antipyretic therapy. So upwards of 60% of patients in the septic group who had fevers over 39.5 degrees received um, some sort of either NSAID or Tylenol and very similar numbers here in the non-septic group. And two things came out of this. One, if you had a fever and you did not have sepsis, if it was a high fever, you were more likely to die. Your mortality was higher. And that was regardless of whether you got Tylenol or ibuprofen or any other antipyretic therapy. So if you had a high fever and it wasn't related to sepsis, you were more likely to die. The other thing that came out is if you had a fever and you did have sepsis, and you got ibuprofen or Tylenol, you were more likely to die. And here's these odd, the odds ratios for those. Um, again, observational study, but it's very interesting. And I think what it starts to show and what we're seeing more and more is that the underlying etiology for fever is as important as fever itself, and perhaps more important. So this has been the largest study to date that I am aware of to randomize ICU patients to fever control or not. Um, this was just published in New England Journal of Medicine just this last year. It randomized 700 patients who had uh, sepsis within the ICU um, relatively early in their ICU course to receive either continuous uh, Tylenol administration, or I should say acetaminophen administration, uh, until death, ICU discharge, or discontinuation of antibiotics compared to just placebo. Their primary outcome was ICU-free days. And you can see by the Kaplan-Meier curve here, there was really no difference whether they received Tylenol versus not. Now the good thing is, is there didn't show, they did not show harm in this as well, uh, but there was no improvement in mortality or survival. So with that, I'll conclude. I think the takeaway points are that fever is really common. We see it, and we have a lot of personally held beliefs about this. I'll give you an example. So I, I know this data fairly well. And in fact, I, I was previously trained as a pediatrician. And there's, there's some data out there that, as we all know, um, you can have fevers associated with vaccine administration um, for little ones. And there's some data that if you pre-treat with some kind of antipyretic like Tylenol, it decreases your immune response. You don't make immunoglobulins as well to that vaccine. And knowing this still, as soon as I got my little daughter home from her first round of like four or five shots, the first thing I wanted to give her was Tylenol. 
So we have these pretty held beliefs about fever control. I think there's probably little evidence for fever control within the medical ICU for sepsis. Now, I think what's still out there is what do we do for people who are having fevers from non-septic sources? And certainly fever associated with neurologic insult, again, I think that's a whole different discussion. And I do think that fever associated with that probably has shown good out, uh, uh, fever control associated with neurologic outcomes has shown better outcomes. Um, but I think in sepsis response, there's potentially a beneficial host, host response that we may not want to blunt. And it's certainly a discussion we can have. And with that, I will leave it uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you.